renovating a large triple expansion model steam engine. This is part 3, finishing the flywheel and my thoughts on the engine. This is the plug gauge that I machined in the last episode, and I don't really need this anymore, or maybe I do, more about that later. So I'm just going to reverse it in the chuck and allow me to machine the other end, because I'm going to make a mandrel on which to turn parts of the flywheel. Some viewers will find this very interesting. It's a really simple piece of equipment, a mandrel that you can put the flywheel on and then turn it to size. But it must remain true at all times, which means that once you start machining it, it must not be removed from the chuck. If you wanted to make a mandrel that you could reuse for other jobs, then you would have to use a collet chuck. Now I've got a collet chuck and I could have done it this way, but I do appreciate that these are very expensive and a lot of viewers will not have access to them. So I'm showing you how to make what is called a stub mandrel in a normal chuck. This is a four-jaw self-centering chuck, but you could use a three-jaw chuck. So don't forget, once you start machining this stub mandrel, do not remove it from the chuck until the flywheel's been mounted on it and the flywheel's been turned, because you will not get it to run true if you take it out of the chuck and then put it back in again. When I make things like stub mandrels, or turn shafts to a set size, I do it in a little bit of a strange way. I initially take a cut at the end of the bar, which is usually slightly undersized, and even before using a micrometer, I try the flywheel on the mandrel for size, and it is of course undersized. The logic behind this is that I have a fixed reference that I must not cut to. If I'd have continued turning the bar, it would have been radically undersized and therefore scrap. So it's just to remind me to take it easy and not take too much metal off the bar. Very, very rarely it has been known to take this first pilot cut and find out that it's almost exactly the right size that I need. But this really is a very rare occurrence and this one's nowhere near. So by using the micrometer and taking small cuts, I eventually get it to be a perfect size for the flywheel to fit on. Had I have made this mandrel in a collet chuck, I would have probably threaded it and put a bolt in the end to hold the part in place. But once this mandrel has been used, it can be discarded, or of course I can turn something else out of it. You've just seen me apply some Loctite 603 to the mandrel, and now it's time to push the flywheel onto the mandrel. There's sufficient clearance on the mandrel for the Loctite 603 to fill the gap, but there's not much clearance at all. This needs to be very, very accurate. The only part of this flywheel that I've already turned is one side completely and the outer part of the other side. And I almost forgot that I faced the front of the centre boss, but I didn't do anything about the side of it. So what I'm doing at the moment is cutting down the side of the centre boss to make it round, because it was wobbling about, as one viewer pointed out. And this clip shows that it's no longer wobbling about because it's turned to a nice round diameter. And now I'm working on the inside edge of the outer part of the flywheel. And once again, as before, you can't really see it from this shot, but I'm using a cut down parting tool, which is really trimmed back. It's not a very strong tool, but it gets into the corners. This video is speeded up considerably. It's running at 800%. But in reality, whilst doing this job, the lathe was running very slowly. This modified parting tool is a high-speed steel parting tool. So periodically, I have to stop the lathe, remove the tool from the tool post, and resharpen it at the grinding wheel. Doing this job in the larger of my two lathes makes things easier because it does have power cross-feed, and that's what's happening at the moment. So I get quite a good finish. After I took a cleaning up cut, I thought I'd just better check that there's sufficient strength in what's left of the flywheel, and there was, so it was okay. The final part of this machining operation is to take a cut along the outside surface of the flywheel. I'm using a substantial round-nosed lathe tool for this, and I'm also removing the sharp edges with the same tool. I'm just using some coarse sandpaper to remove the sharp edges on the inside part of the flywheel. Now I take the mandrel out of the chuck complete with the flywheel and I put a brass collar on the mandrel and I clamp the mandrel in the vise very lightly. The only thing holding this flywheel to the mandrel is some Loctite 603 and this clip shows me heating the part with my gas blow lamp 
and this will cause the Loctite 603 to give way. You have to get it pretty hot, but not glowing red. Not as hot as I got the crankwebs in a previous video. I put a bit too much heat on there, but they were very small. Just give it a nice even heating with the blow lamp. And then all you have to do is tap the mandrel with a small hammer. Been very careful, of course, not to smash the flywheel. And a Viking axe is out of the question for this job. In the end of this piece of steel that I used for making the mandrel, there was a centre, and this has proven to be quite useful. I'm using a screwdriver to tap the mandrel all the way out of the flywheel. And now all the experts really do need to look away, go and do something else, go and watch a TV programme. Um, what I'm doing is cleaning up the flywheel with some coarse sandpaper, but I'm also bell-mouthing the centre part. So with a bit of luck, it will fit on the crankshaft, which is actually slightly tapered, as I mentioned in the last episode. So here, I'm drilling the flywheel to put a grub screw in. I'm using an M6 grub screw. I use the centre drill first, followed by a twist drill. And then using a tap, I carefully threaded it to take an M6 grub screw. This clip shows me gently tapping the flywheel into place on the crankshaft. I'm obviously using a soft hammer for this. And that's about as far as it will go because the wooden bearers are in the way. So at last, I've been waiting for this moment, I've tightened the grub screw, and I can rotate the flywheel and see what happens when I do that. Obviously the crankshaft's going to go round, but it lets me feel at the engine to see how well it's made. It feels a little bit lumpy, but then it's never run, and everything's probably a little bit tight and needs adjusting. There are, of course, three cylinders, so there is friction on three sets of valves and three pistons in the three cylinders to contend with. If you watched the last episode, you will notice that I had two flywheel castings. I've only currently machined one of them, but I intend to machine the second flywheel to exactly the same dimensions as this one. I won't be showing a video of me doing that, it would just be a repeat of what I've already done. And the idea being that two flywheels accurately machined and next to each other will look like one thicker flywheel. But without the weight penalty of a large solid lump of cast iron, as a flywheel on what is essentially quite a thin crankshaft. There's a long way to go on this rebuild, but that's it for the moment. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.